This is an advanced base somewhere in the far north, one of the many Army and Air Force installations which have been constructed over much of the free world. It is part of an integrated system of military bases set up a thousand miles from nowhere to protect your freedom. Whether manned by a handful of specialists or by thousands of military personnel, there is one essential commodity which a base like this must have to carry out its mission, and that is power. Obviously, operations and even human life in such areas depend on a reliable source of electric power and heat. At present, a major portion of the supply tonnage to support an Arctic base consists of fuel oil required to generate this electricity and heat. Getting fuel to such bases is one of the greatest logistic problems faced by the military services. Supply by ship is very seasonable, being limited to the short period each year when the waters in the area are ice-free, usually less than 60 days. Unfavorable weather conditions may make supplying such bases virtually impossible. Some of the more remote bases are supplied entirely by air. Needless to say, flying conditions in the Arctic are extremely hazardous and very unpredictable. Even in peacetime, these conditions add up to an extremely difficult logistical task. And in time of war, the problem is further complicated by the vulnerability to enemy attack of the long exposed supply lines. Since these bases are vital to our defense and must continue to operate at all costs, something had to be done to try to alleviate this problem. Nuclear power offered a promising solution to the logistic problem since it was felt that nuclear power plants could be built to operate over extended periods of time without refueling. Thus, the great military advantage of such power plants would be the virtual elimination of the effort required to transport and store bulky fuels for conventional plants. For several years, the Army's Corps of Engineers and the Atomic Energy Commission in Washington had been conducting a number of studies exploring the use of nuclear power for military purposes. The evaluation of all the data collected showed that the power requirements for certain Arctic bases could be met by nuclear energy sources with favorable cost comparisons and logistical savings. Therefore, the AEC called upon its Oak Ridge National Laboratory to work with the Corps of Engineers in developing a nuclear reactor design which might be applicable for military use. After evaluating various reactor concepts, a group at Oak Ridge concluded that a heterogeneous, pressurized water reactor offered the greatest promise of satisfactory performance. They then prepared a conceptual design, every component of which was to be air transportable, hence the terminology package power reactor. In principle, a nuclear power plant is similar to a conventional power plant. The major difference is that the reactor replaces the furnace and fuel handling equipment with the advantage that the plant will operate for a long time before refueling is required. Basically, this is the way a pressurized water reactor, such as the one conceived at Oak Ridge, operates. When these control rods are raised, a chain reaction takes place within this core. Heat is generated by the chain reaction and heats the highly purified water in this primary loop. The water is maintained under pressure by the pressurizer to prevent boiling in the reactor. It is this feature of the design which gives the reactor system its name, pressurized water reactor. The pressurized water is circulated through the steam generator and then back to the reactor by this pump. In the steam generator, Heat is transferred to the secondary water, producing steam. The steam, in turn, runs this conventional turbine generator, producing electricity. The exhaust steam flows to the condenser, where it is condensed by cooling water pumped from a well or river. The condensate is then pumped through the feed water heater back to the steam generator, to be reheated and converted into steam, thus completing the secondary cycle. 
All of the nuclear equipment in the primary system is enclosed in an airtight steel shell called the vapor container. This container is a safety measure to prevent the possibility of release of radioactive materials in the event of a major incident. Primary shielding from the effects of radiation is usually provided by surrounding the reactor with a dense material, such as lead, iron, or concrete, with additional or secondary shielding being provided by concrete surrounding the vapor container. An analysis of the Oak Ridge conceptual design conducted by the Operations Research Office of Johns Hopkins University showed definite military and economic advantages were possible at certain remote Arctic military installations. Based upon this analysis, the Chief of Engineers recommended to the Department of the Army that a prototype nuclear power plant, following the Oak Ridge design, be constructed within the United States. The Army's Corps of Engineers was given the development responsibilities for the Department of Defense. The expense of the plant was to be shared jointly by the Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Defense, and construction was to accomplish three broad objectives. The first was to solve the technical construction and operational problems associated with a reliable nuclear power plant for military use. The second objective was to provide firm cost information, operating parameters, and engineering test data necessary to adapt the system to a remote location. And the third objective was to provide a training facility for military specialists from all three armed services who would eventually be required to operate and service additional plants. While the AEC began an evaluation of qualified contractors, personnel at Oak Ridge were engaged in analyzing certain aspects of the conceptual design. The feasibility of the core design was verified by an analysis on the computer. Investigations were made on the material to be used in the fuel elements. The effects of irradiation were studied by inserting a sample element into a test reactor and analyzing the irradiated samples in the hot laboratory. The tests indicated the materials were stable when subjected to radiation. Then the stability of the plant operation was checked. Here, a technician is putting information into the analog to simulate the action of the control rods. And to complete the analysis, a series of critical experiments were made on a mock-up core to check the calculations and nuclear design. The results of these overall tests indicated that the design was basically sound. In the meantime, after a careful consideration of numerous locations throughout the country, the Engineer Research and Development Laboratories, located within the U.S. Army Engineer Center at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, was selected as the tentative site of the prototype plant. Before a definite decision could be made, statistics had to be gathered on the conditions at the site. Data were gathered on such things as weather conditions, geological conditions, temperature and chemical quality of the Potomac River, and radiological background of the area. The United States Geological Survey, Coast and Geodetic Survey, and Weather Bureau contributed notably to this effort. From the information gathered, the Gunston Cove site was determined to be satisfactory for construction. In addition to offering an abundant source of cooling water, the location of the site near the Army Engineer School at Fort Belvoir made the plant readily accessible for training purposes, one of the three major objectives established for the project. Then on December 10, 1954, after consideration of 18 bidders from all over the United States, Alco Products Incorporated was awarded a contract by the Atomic Energy Commission to design and build the first package power reactor. An Army Corps of Engineers officer was appointed by the Atomic Energy Commission to supervise the construction, and Alco retained Stone and Webster Engineering Corporation to design the non-nuclear portion and to construct the entire plant. This was the first fixed fee contract with a guarantee of performance to be awarded in the reactor field. The work was divided into five phases. Phase one covered the preparation of the flow diagram and calculation of the heat balance for the primary and secondary systems. During phase two, 
reactor scientists worked on preliminary designs and the data for a hazards report. After successful presentations of this report to the AEC Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, the detailed design began. During Phase 3, numerous engineers and technicians made an analysis of the design, drew up specifications and details of construction, and procured materials and equipment. During Phase 4, components such as the reactor vessel were fabricated. And in Phase 5, field engineers solved the many problems involved in actual construction. On October 5, 1955, the clearing of the site got underway. Sheet piling was used to hold back the earth during excavation to maintain the original compaction of the soil for the building foundation. Then, in accordance with the overall schedule, excavation was begun for the vapor container foundation. This was followed closely by the laying of the foundations for the building. Within 40 days, the concrete footings and foundation walls for the vapor container were being poured. After this, the structural steel work was begun. Meanwhile, the vapor container foundation walls were completed, and after the forms were removed, the vapor container skirt was erected. While some worked above, others worked below on the vapor container that would house all of the nuclear equipment. The steel sections, which were fabricated by Bethlehem Steel Company, were carefully welded together to form an airtight shell. The base of the vapor container was placed below ground to provide stability. By late in March 1956, welders were working on the cylindrical portion of the shell. During erection, all welded seams were tested thoroughly by radiographing to detect any cracks, however minute. And upon completion, the vapor container was again tested for leaks, first by filling it with water under high pressure, and then after draining it, by filling it with a helium air mixture and probing every inch of every seam for indications of leakage. After successful completion of these tests, which indicated that the vapor container was airtight, work was started on the interior. The anchor bolts for the reactor vessel, steam generator and pressurizer were installed. Then, the lower end of the vapor container was filled with concrete to provide a flat floor for mounting the nuclear equipment. Rapidly, the building shell was nearing completion. Concurrently with this came the installation of a thin steel inner lining in the vapor container. Section by section, the liner was put together. An inner layer of concrete two feet thick was raised by stages as the liner was erected. The liner acted as a form for this inner layer of concrete, as well as providing a smooth surface for possible decontamination. After the inner layer of concrete was added, the vapor container was surrounded by an additional three feet of concrete, extending from ground level to the height of the building roof to provide additional shielding for operating personnel. Condenser cooling water lines were laid from the Potomac River. Elsewhere, Alco and its contractors were involved in other phases of the project. For example, in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, Lucan Steel Company was rolling the two-inch steel plates to be used in the reactor vessel, the steam generator, and the pressurizer. In Dunkirk, New York, Alco personnel were fabricating the steam generator and other components. Meanwhile, officers and men from all three military services were being trained as operators and technicians in anticipation of the day when the plant would begin operation. These personnel would also provide a cadre to train additional operators and technicians for future plants. Twelve months after the first tree was felled, the structure was complete. Now the equipment arriving as planned had to be installed. 
piece by piece through the opening in the top of the vapor container. The steam generator was lowered through the opening and placed on the anchor bolts. The shell of the steam generator was fabricated of two inch thick steel plates and clad on the inside with stainless steel to resist corrosion. Next, the condenser was installed on the lower level of the building and cooling water pumps were secured in place. The turbine was positioned and lowered into place. The turbine is of conventional design and was manufactured by the General Electric Company. It is this turbine that converts the heat energy of the steam into rotary motion. This rotary motion is transferred through the reduction gears to the generator, which converts it into electricity. After the turbine was secured, the reduction gear box was installed and aligned. Then the generator, also of conventional design and manufactured by General Electric, was installed. Now the time had come to install the station service equipment and the electrical controls in the central control room. While work was going on inside the building, provisions were being made to provide parallel operation with the existing system of the Virginia Electric and Power Company. By July 30th, 1956, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, having completed the fabrication of the fuel elements, shipped them to Schenectady. Here in Schenectady, Alco engineers experimentally determined the core characteristics in this company-owned critical facility. The core was put through a series of tests, and the control rods were calibrated before being shipped to Fort Belvoir. At the construction site, the reactor vessel was being placed in the vapor container. This pressure vessel, which will contain the nuclear core, is the heart of the nuclear power plant. Standing 13 feet 6 inches high and weighing 32,000 pounds, the reactor vessel, like the steam generator, was fabricated of 2-inch steel plate and clad on the inside with stainless steel. By November 1956, the installation of all the equipment in the primary system was completed. Each component was individually checked, and the integrity of the entire system was tested using radiographing, hydrostatic, and helium leak tests, similar to those carried out on the vapor container. In addition, every electrical instrument had to be checked to ensure its proper operation. All of the equipment and instrumentation had been installed and tested. In the secondary or steam system, the turbine generator. The evaporator used to purify the water. And the condenser. And in the vapor container, all primary system components including the primary shield tank in the background which houses the reactor along with the control rod driving mechanism in the pit. The insulated piping which carries the highly purified pressurized water. The primary coolant pumps which circulate the primary water. The steam generator located in the rear between the pumps. And the pressurizer which maintains the pressure in the primary system. Non-nuclear tests had to be run on the entire circuit to demonstrate the integrity of the systems. Upon completion of these tests, construction was finished and the plant was ready to receive the nuclear fuel. Now, the real advantage of nuclear power. Enough fuel for one and a half to two years of operation of the plant was unloaded from a single plane onto one small truck. This fuel was stored in a small vault until it was inserted into the reactor. The reactor is fueled with 45 of these elements, each made up of stainless steel clad plates containing highly enriched uranium. Seven of these elements have sections of neutron absorbing material joined to the top and are used as control rods. To insert the fuel elements, specially designed handling tools are required. The tool is inserted into the element and secured. 
The element is then raised to the platform on top of the primary shield tank and lowered into the core. This core, in the form of a cube, measuring 22 inches on a side and weighing only several hundred pounds, will fuel this nuclear power plant for one and a half to two years and will produce the same amount of electricity as approximately 60,000 barrels of diesel oil. With insertion of the fuel elements, the plant was complete and ready to operate. Zero power and low power tests were conducted during which the proper operation of all equipment, both nuclear and conventional, was checked. The mechanical action of the control rod was carefully checked. At 11.13 on April 15, 1957, the plant was put into operation. After a short shakedown period, a 700-hour operational test was begun. The completed plant operates like this. When the control rods are raised, a chain reaction will take place inside the reactor, heating the water. These rods control the reaction rate by absorbing some of the neutrons produced during the fission process. When the rods are lowered into the core, the reaction rate is reduced by the absorption of neutrons by the poisons in the control rods. Therefore, when the rods are raised, the reaction rate is allowed to increase and the highly purified water is heated and circulated under pressure through the tubes in the steam generator by the primary circulating pump. Pressure is maintained in the primary system by the pressurizer to prevent the water from boiling in the reactor. In the steam generator, heat is transferred to the secondary water surrounding the tubes, converting the secondary water to steam. The steam produced flows to the turbine generator, producing electricity. The exhaust steam leaving the turbine is then condensed in the condenser by cooling water pumped from the Potomac River. Once condensed, the secondary water is pumped through the feed water heater back to the steam generator, thus completing the cycle. The shielding of the reactor and its associated equipment is divided into two major sections the primary shield surrounding the reactor vessel inside the vapor container, and the secondary shield, consisting of the concrete inner liner of the vapor container and the three feet of concrete surrounding it. At 3 p.m. on April 29, 1957, the plant was officially dedicated by Admiral Louis L. Straws, Chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, and Secretary of the Army, Wilbur M. Brucker. In the name of the government of the United States and our great president, dedicate this Army Package Power Reactor to the uses of humanity and for peace, and may it unremittingly be ever thus. Ladies and gentlemen, with your permission now, I'll ask and invite Admiral Straws, my good counterpart, formerly of the United States Navy, to join with the army and not let my hand be the sole one that turns this switch. So, Admiral, if you'll come over when the moment arrives, we'll join together. Let's put your hand right on. All right, put it right on. This rotating radar antenna is symbolic of military uses of nuclear power. And conversely, the printing press is a symbol of civilian applications. Through the combined efforts of the AEC, the Army's Corps of Engineers, and civilian industry, atomic energy was being used to generate electric power. A packaged power reactor, every component of which could be transported by air and assembled at a remote base, was possible. Many logistical problems, which had seemed impossible in the past, now could be solved. The Army Package Power Reactor is the forerunner of smaller, more mobile nuclear power plants to be developed for the armed forces. <laughs>